Welcome again, everyone. So um, I follow that tradition that says that you begin things with a song. And so I want to begin with, in a sense, um, a call to the earth um, because of the hard times in which we live. Uh, and this is a Yoruba song. And then the essential meaning of it is Mother Earth, hold us for life is hard, or the world is hard. It goes like this. hold us, for this world is hard. So the song, in a sense, is calling up the earth energy. And uh, I like to remind folks that the earth is sending us energy all the time. That's the nature of the world in which we live, even though it may be forgotten in many ways. So the earth is sending energy up through the feet. And the energy of the earth, like the energy coming down from the stars, uh, does, is not stopped by, you know, uh, flooring or even a bad rug. Um, it comes right up through that and can enter a person. And so um, there's lots of practices about calling up the earth energy. And, and that's also a reminder that we are the children of the earth, that we are the beings born to live on earth. And the earth tries to keep supporting us. And so people used to have songs in order to remind each other of that. And particularly particularly when the world has become a hard place. And that's the, you know, that's the world we live in now, the world of great polarity. And you can even say the world of darkness, that we're in the dark times. And, um, but the earth energy continues to come. And it's a good time to begin to remember the old ideas and the old practices that people found by living close to earth and close to the nature. That's how these old things were found. And our future, I hope, involves us learning to live close to the earth and close to nature again, but we can practice it right now. I also usually involve and include a poem at the beginning based on the idea that poetry is a natural speech of the human soul. And so um, this is a, uh, a poem from uh, Hafez. He calls it In the Music. For over 60 years I've been forgetful, I mean in almost every moment. Yet not for a second has all this flowing toward me slowed down or even stopped. I know now that I have done nothing to deserve this gift of being and this chance of being here, nothing. 
And sometimes I recognize that I am the guest that the mystics have been talking about. And only then do I realize that we play this living music of life for the unseen host. Everything we say and everything we sing and everything we pray here is for the sake of the divine. Beautiful idea. It's the same idea as the earth sending us energy. We're actually, as human beings, stretched between the starry heaven and the deep earth. And the starry heaven is pouring energy down on us also. It's called the galaxy up there, and galaxy comes from lactose. There's milk in it, there's nourishment, the milk of the stars coming down, and the energy of the earth rising up. We're actually stretched between those things, and we have access to them, but we have to surrender to get it, or to allow it, or to receive it. And grace and gratitude both have to do with that sense of surrender. Um, grace and gratitude are, in the ancient Greeks, had the notion that there was two ways to account for what happens in the world. And one way was logic, reason, logos was the Greek word, and the other was mythos. And mythos was everything that wasn't logos. And so that meant that mythos included all the emotions and all the um, feeling states, but also all the imagination, all the things that weren't logical and, and, and factual and literal were part of mythos, the mythological world. And grace and gratitude are part of that world. Um, grace is not about achievement or accumulation, as in the materialistic world. It's about surrender and sudden abundance within. Grace, in a sense, falls upon us, and we can also fall out of grace. And one way to understand the modern world is a world that's fallen out of grace. So these, I, the sense of grace and gratitude are actually big things that are mm, supportive of human life, but also that are indications of the growth of a spiritual and soulful sense of oneself. Uh, gratitude, the, the reason I say growth is because gratitude involves a state of wholeness, even if it lasts only for a moment. Um, if a person is too fragmented, they can't have gratitude. Gratitude requires that we're whole for a moment. Everything comes together and we feel grateful. And usually the old idea was you feel grateful for the gift of life. Um, I know that's hard now with the world being so challenging and so conf conflicted and so threatening in the future, being so uncertain. But we are the ones now alive with the gift of life. And in a basic way, it's better than the other uh, possibility, which is not being alive. And so, but when a person realizes the gift of life, that is part of when we feel gratitude. And feeling, grati feeling grateful means I am whole for this moment. So there are two powerful states of being, grace and gratitude. Um, and they're mythological. In Greek mythology, which tends to be actually quite rational, even though they had the idea that mythos wasn't rational. It became kind of rational, their mythology. But anyway, in that mythology, they have the three graces, the personifications of grace, um, who embody charm and beauty, um, but also nature and creativity were aspects of grace. Um, and each of the goddesses, there's three of them, I'll name them, but they are each links to the divine source of, of life as well as grace. In a way you could say having life is a, a grace in itself. So the three of them in the Greek system were Aglaia, uh, which represents the grace of beauty, nature, and artistry. And you notice that nature and creative arts are put together. The arts are part of the expression of human nature. Uh, the second one is euphorsine, the grace of joy, delight, and well-being. And there you notice that well-being is connected to joy and delight. Uh, Carl Jung, the great 
psychologist said there's a child of joy existing inside of each person waiting to be recognized. Um, so well-being is connected to joy, or joy partly comes from well, well-being, and well-being and joy come from grace. And the third one is thalia, uh, the grace of blossoming, abundance, but also festival and ritual. So there's, uh, there's, there's the blossoming of the soul, which is a state of grace, uh, which, and there's also the sense of abundance in life, which is related to grace. And then there's the idea of festivals uh, and rituals that are dedicated to feeling, to bringing down, in a sense, this state of grace and f- to feeling the abundance, the hidden abundance of life and the capacity of life to renew itself. And so those were aspects of, uh, of grace in ancient Greece, but the actual cult of the graces uh, was prior to the development of Greek culture. So it goes back to the more ancient earth-oriented cultures. Um, and, and those cultures, so notice the graces are, are feminine figures. Um, the whole idea, it, it goes back to the song I was singing, uh, Mother Earth, the feminine, is the source of nourishment um, and care. That's those are attributes of the earth energy. Uh, but grace is also connected to that kind of spiritual nourishment. Um, and so it's all connected to the feminine. And so as you go back in, leave history behind and go back into mythology, you find all these powerful images and, and spirits and energies uh, that are really helpful and that have been forgotten or cast aside um, because of the world of logos, of reason, of subject-object being divided. Uh, when you have gratitude, nothing's divided. When you have grace, everything can be seen as being connected. So we need to go back to those things, not just for our own personal well-being, which is part of the process of grace, but also for the well-being of the planet, as people call it now. Um, so this is, in a sense, part of the lost feminine. And I think that's one reason why I like doing evenings just on gratitude and grace. And part of the, if we stay with Greek mythology, the lost feminine goes back to Gaia. Uh, Gaia comes from a root, G-I, which means earth. And so Gaia goes back to the earth as the creative center of life. And it's more than what people have come to know as the Gaia hypothesis, which you can hear is a kind of scientific term. Uh, Gaia was known as the all mother, as mother nature, as the source of all creation, as the source of healing, and as the womb of abundance that is ever living onward. I mean, it was a big, tremendous image, the sense of Gaia, which, and the graces come from that big old feminine, ancient imagination, really archetypal imagination. Um, and, and so it's an important kind of recognition that something full of grace and capable of evoking gratitude and capable of bringing uh, inner support and even states of peace and joy has been lost in terms of how people think about the world. Um, And it never gets completely lost. I I was raised as a Catholic, and and I like going to church. I mean, church is an interesting thing. Churches, cathedrals, temples uh, are arranged so that they're sanctuaries, and then the building uh, comes to a dome at top, and then there's a steeple. And the whole idea of that shape, the steeple, is to pull the energy of the divine down from heaven or from the galaxy, however you want to think about it, and then it enters the container of the sanctuary of the church where the people are. And it's like bringing grace down. And the old song, one of the old sayings in Christian churches is that um, the spirit won't come down unless you sing. <coughs> so there's this sense of pulling grace down. And of course, in times like this, we learn, have to learn how to do that um, more often and in better ways. When I was a child in church, 
they would have the statues of God, uh, the Father, and then the statues of Jesus, the Holy Son, uh, and then the statues of Mary, the mother, who was Gaia, who was the All-Mother, who was the womb of life. And she was the mother of Christ, who was the divine born as human, but she was also called the mother of God. That was really an intriguing thing. And uh, to me, I think for many other people, when you were feeling in pain and when you needed the sense of protection or the sense of forgiveness, it would be the the mother goddess, the uh, Virgin Mary, she was called, but also called the mother, the Virgin Mother. This is an archetypal image of the divine feminine. That's the one that I would kneel and pray to. And we'd have prayers like Hail Mary. When I am in trouble, I'll hear the Hail Mary starting inside myself. Um, that's not a bad thing. Um, so this, this, I'm saying these are all parts of the background from which the grace is coming, from which gratitude and grace come. Uh, I'm, so in ancient myths from India, you had uh, Prajapati, who would be the lord of creatures who creates the world. But in many of the really old stories, Prajapati has the companion Vak, V-A-K, who is the uh, feminine uh, energy of life and the source of vitality and also the expression uh, of creation itself. And so back in the ancient times, you would have the idea of this pair that we would see as masculine and feminine. If you follow the story of Vak and uh, Prajapati all the way back, they interchange with each other and sometimes they come out as one being with two sides. And so, again, I'm calling here back to the ancient feminine as being part of what's missing. And when it's missing, then we lose things like grace and the sense of uh, gratitude as an easily accessible state if we can just surrender and let go to the things that we hold on to tightly. Um, So um, just to give a sense of the way those stories work, Prajapati, um, and this to me is interesting because it, it shows something about the state of the world uh, when the world is in creation, which by the way, creation isn't just something back there, it continues all the time. So when we get the idea of creation myths in creation, it's not just an old thing, it's an immediate thing. And getting that gives access to things like grace and like gratitude, like joy, like beauty. And uh, But in the old stories, it says Prajapati um, suddenly felt a kind of a heat in his mind, and then something began to swell in his chest, and before he knew it, a whole series of manifestations came from the original deity, pouring out as the world itself, pouring out as mountains and lakes, as forests, as animals and all kinds of things. He didn't know it was coming. It poured out of him. And then when when it all came out in its full abundance to what we call the world, um, suddenly he felt lonely and empty. And when he felt that way, he felt sorrow and he felt fearful. And then when he was in that state, he created the world again. This time he created it out of loss and sorrow, out of fear and anxiety. And that part of the world, you could call it the shadows of the world, came pouring out as well. And until that happened, that second creation, the world wasn't finished. But throughout all of that time, the expression, the dynamic, the vitality of what was being created was coming from Vak. So Vak is the uh, feminine principle of Shakti. It's also called Shakti. Uh, And it's the primal energy and the sound of creation. Uh, Vak manifests as uh, as sound, as reverberation, as resonance. Many of the old myths say that it, it, it not back in the beginning was the word, but back in the beginning was the sound. And Vak represents that reverberation from the primal source of creation that is continuing to resonate through the world. Um, and so Vak was the essential energy, the sacred sound of creation, the living speech of all things. In ancient um, Australia, the aboriginals say, Yoro, Yoro, 
everything in the world vibrating in its own way, each thing standing up and speaking to you, what do you have to say? That idea that we are part of this resonance from the beginning, we are part of the, we are each a unique vibration of this energy of creation and this living sound of Vak. So um, to me, it's beautiful stuff. And the reason ancient cultures have so many songs is because the songs were a, a conscious tuning in to the reverberations and the resonance that is creation itself, continuing from the original time until now. And so in some of those cultures, they would say, whenever we mingle the natural energies of our bodies with the spiritual dimensions of our souls, we blend our earthliness with our heavenly longings, and then we can reconnect to the origins of life and awaken the divine sense of grace and gratitude hidden within us. So one of the reasons to learn songs, to learn mantras, to learn chants is in the very act of doing it. It's a form of prayer. And in the act of doing it, we retune ourselves. Those ancient songs use vowels and, and rhythms in certain way that they retune what nowadays people would call the brain and the mind to the heart and the heart to the body and the body to the soul. And it's in those kind of conditions that we can find ourselves more able to surrender, more able to be open and vulnerable in the right direction and more able to receive grace and find gratitude. So um, in a way, or one thing I like to say, is that we are in a collective rite of passage and where the world that we knew is already gone and we haven't entered fully yet that the world that's trying to come into creation. And despite what some modern people, thinkers might say, some modern thinkers, uh, um, human beings are in the middle of the whole thing. As I said, stretched between the heavens above and the energies of the earth below. Um, and so to go through a change from what used to be to what's trying to come into being is called rite of passage or an initiation. And it's an ordeal, but part of the value of it, if we can let go enough of the things that hold us back on the internal level and in the outside world, uh, we find that creation is trying to continue and the energy of creation is trying to enter the world through us. That's an old mystical understanding. It's not a pretension, it's not a, a self, you know, aggrandizing. It's just the nature of things. And so uh, there were many old practices, prayers and songs and dances and all kinds of things that were used, meditations and, and solitudes and all kinds of things. Everybody has their own way that are used to become more present, to become more vulnerable, to become more open, and thereby to become a potential vessel for the delivery of grace and creative energy. And then that leads to the moments of wholeness that are called gratitude. And through that process, a person not only grows their own self and their own soul, but they have a beneficial effect on the neighbors and the world around them. And it's in that way that the world changes. At least that's what they used to say. And I'm following those old stories. Um, so um, grace, you could say, involves a recognition that there are unearned moments that add meaning and value to our lives. There are positive things, powerful, transformative things that we can experience that we not did not actively work towards or necessarily even ask for that came to us as grace. So two old ideas. One is on earth, we never have to go the whole way. That's not the idea. We go far enough and the other world, the world of mythos, the world of imagination, the eternal world comes to us. The, an old saying was, it's not just that the thirsty want water, it's also that the water wants to be drunk. Um, so that's part of it. And then, uh, and maybe the, maybe the other thing I'm thinking of is um, when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough, 
we often find that there are energies in psychology, they call it the archetypal energies, that are trying to assist us in living in meaningful ways. It's not that we have to invent the whole thing, it's that we have to allow the creative to reinvent us and the way we live. So I see there are questions, so I'll stop for questions. People talk a lot about abundance these days, but to me it keeps feeling like an expression of privilege, and I find it hard to look past that. I usually replace it with words such as faith or fortune. Can you say a bit more about what abundance means to you? Thank you. Thank you for the thoughtful thought process there. I'm talking about an inner abundance, and I'm talking about an abundance that comes from, the, uh, from creation. I'll restate. Creation isn't something that happened in the past and it's just, you know, we're in the aftermath. Creation is going on all the time. That's why uh, the world is dark at night and it comes back in the light of the day. It's a constant manifestation of loss and renewal, of darkness and light. Um, and so that's a, a, um, a process of great abundance. Um, fortune is only a part of abundance. Um, I know it's complicated because there are a lot of places and a lot of people that don't have an abundance of food or an abundance of protection or enough nourishment. And, and that's a situation that's getting worse. Literally two days ago, according to people who keep data, and believe me, people keep data, uh, literally two days ago, we surpassed 8 billion people on planet Earth. And so that's an abundance, maybe one that we can't support easily, but that is also the abundance of creation itself. And so I'm talking about um, not a material abundance, but I guess you'd call it an emotional, spiritual, soulful abundance that we shouldn't deny, even if we're feeling mm, the pain of uh, lack of abundance in so many parts of the earth. I guess that's, that's what I'm talking about. How is gratitude and grace, or how are gratitude and grace related to courage, justice, mercy, and peace? Who? well, let's see. Um, I think they're different than, than courage, uh, certainly than justice. So one of the great things about mythology and myth, mythical systems, is they give, they have spirits or deities, gods and goddesses, representing the various energies in the world. Uh, people misunderstand that cultures that had many deities didn't, it didn't mean that they didn't understand that everything was at some essential level united or everything was one. But we live in the realm of the one and the many. There was a oneness from which everything came, but everything came like Prajapati uh, had that experience. And so, um, so uh, I think those things are related Gratitude and grace related to courage, justice, uh, you know, because they're part of this mythos, this psychological, mythological realm. Mercy and peace can, see to, can be seen to be much closer to gratitude and grace. So let me just go back to these uh, deities. Um, one of my favorite deities is Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin is the goddess of mercy and peace but also forgiveness and grace. And so it's, it's not that there is a Kuan Yin, it's not about history, it's not about um, believing in things, it's just like the imagination of it. So I have, at, when you enter my house, you pass by two uh, statues of Kuan Yin. Uh, so every time I go out, every time I go in, I'm reminding myself of uh, mercy, peace, and grace. <clears throat> and so imagine ancient people lived that way. They had uh, rituals and they had deities. And it wasn't that they were few, foolish and they didn't know how to measure things. It was more that they had a living internal life and they knew how to imagine things. And so, um, so I don't know, courage has to do with heart in a way. 
but the heart does many, many things. It can gather the energy of courage just the way it pumps blood through the body, but the heart can also open to receive grace, which is really kind of important. And you remember the old saying, the only heart worth having is a broken heart, because until your heart is broken, nothing can get in and not much comes out. And so, um, for what it's worth, um, let's see. I'm just beginning to mentor a young person who has attempted suicide. In what ways have you found to inspire young people uh, that living is indeed better than the alternative these days. Thank you. So this is a little uh, sidestep, but it's an important one. So young people are growing up into this world that is full of threat and danger. Uh, um, it's very common for young people he to hear and absorb the sense that the world will not continue. That's often the view from science. It's also strangely the view from religion where you know, most of the big religions believe that the world comes to an end. Um, mythology doesn't go that way. Um, so stories that show how the world continues are really helpful to modern young people. Um, but um, I appreciate you mentoring a young person. And the first thing that I learned to say and work through with young people who are in despair or suicidal is that it's not that they inside want to die, it's that a part of them needs to die. It's a distinction. Uh, young people, you know, they're in the, the either or, they're in the extremes of things, that's part of being young. So everyone, when they, when they were young, at some point had a sense of suicide. It's very universally common. Most people don't do it. But nowadays, it is literally more prominent. They just come out with the latest study of despair and depression and suicide amongst children and young people. It really is a growing thing. And it's because the culture doesn't have enough myths and stories that are coherent and that remind everybody that things can go all the way falling out of grace into darkness and then that they can, can come back again. And instead, we're in this march of the blind history, you know, and, and history is, uh, is a limited view of the world, much less full of knowledge than, than I would say than myth is. So young people need to hear stories of how the world renews because then they, like when a child hears fairy tales, they learn how despite the giants and, and whatever happens that the little heroes survive. Well, there's bigger stories, not for children, but for young people and for grown people to Im be imagining how the world can go dark and fall into dark places and people become delusional and become polarized. And it doesn't mean that the world is over. It means we're in the chaos again. And then if we accept that, accepting some of the chaos uh, suddenly allows the, world, the, the soul to regather itself and then you can have a renewal in the soul. Um, so that's some thoughts about it. But again, thank you for working with young people. Do you think it is important to speak or write words of gratitude, even if you're not feeling it? Or is it better to wait until you actually feel more whole and thus feel genuine gratitude? Is there any validity in faking, faking it until you're making it in this regard? I try to keep a practice of journal journalizing gratitude each morning, and oftentimes I'm just not feeling it, but go through the motion anyhow. Is it a practice or a state of being? Thank you, good question, thanks for the honesty. It's a state of being. We have to practice being ourselves to find it. So, I mean, I know from the question that you know the answer. Uh, the real, the authentic things, the deep feelings, you can't fake it to make it. Uh, they're either there or not. So what I find interesting, like if I'm not feeling grateful at all, okay, I'll go back to my definition of gratitude. Gratitude is a state of wholeness, even if it's temporary, even a momentary state of wholeness. And if I'm too fragmented and too caught in my inner oppositions, my inner conflicts, I don't feel gra grateful. So then, um, so the point isn't to then go like, 
appear like I'm being grateful or pretend that I'm being grateful, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not actually healthy. The healthy thing would be to find out what's keeping me fragmented and, and oppose what the conflict is. Get into the conflict, and then you're in the condition like a person in a mythological story, start struggling with the demons and whatever they might be. And when that honest struggle happens, that's when grace comes in. That's when gratitude can happen. We have to accept the torn apart oppositional conflicted things in order to find the whole again that's true for the individual right now it's true for the entire world the entire world is in uh what do they call it polarization is everywhere it's everywhere you can you can hear about it everywhere it's not a final state it's actually a creative state if we can accept and be honest about the tension we're in that's the first step to leading the way out the polarization, the conflict and opposition is intended to be a creative tension. And the idea isn't one side or the other wins. That's the confusion and often delusion of modern po politics and even modern economics. What happens when you hold the tension, it becomes creative. And a third thing occurs. And possible third things are moments of gratitude for the gift of life despite the conflict, but also moments of grace when something comes in that we didn't even ask for and didn't exactly earn. We just aligned. The alignment goes two ways. Internally, it goes from conflict, confusion, fear, anxiety, to aligning with, you can call it the deep self or the deep soul. Both ideas work. And when we get that alignment, we are then suddenly aligned with the soul of the world or aligned with the the stars, if, however you want to think about it. And in that state of alignment, we become capable of being creative ourselves, but also we become capable of feeling blessed, of feeling gratitude, and feeling the presence of revivifying grace. How do you reconcile the feminine grace of being with the masculine values of doing and accomplishing that are so prevalent in our culture? Well, they're hard to reconcile in the modern world because the feminine and the grace are not fully recognized themselves and people don't realize that they're supposed to be Prajapati and Vak. Uh, that, you know, as yin and yang is a good example of it in, in Asian culture, the, the philosophical concept of yin and yang, which then becomes darkness and light, which eventually becomes, you know, the feminine and the masculine. And so most people now just get it at the level of genders and things like that. And, and it's not as informative as if we have the full philosophical sense of yin and yang or the mythological sense of paired creative deities. Um, and so it's going to be a while working on the reconciliation between those things. But it really, to me, it has to start with the realization that the loss of the feminine is an enormous thing. If you imagine Vak, Sophia was another of the goddesses that created the world. Um, you imagine these goddesses that create the world. You find them in tribal myths all over the place, and you find them in, in, in ancient mythologies all over the world. Um, that That is a, the, the companion, sometimes the original energy of the whole thing the womb from which all birth comes, that's what's missing. And with it is missing the sense of containment, whole natural containment that holds the opposites, the masculine and the feminine. The womb holds both, literally, and metaphorically, and symbolically, and mythologically. So when we find aspects of the lost feminine, which I want to underline is a really big thing that includes Mother Nature, Mother Earth, Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, you know, the whole cosmos can be seen as feminine. It can be seen as a big womb having many, many layers of creation going on. That's what we've lost. We've lost the fact that it all comes together as a whole, and we've lost the fact that we are being supported secretly by that wholeness that has mostly been forgotten. And so the first step is to realize we've really lost something big and then you know then the steps can come of how do we find it how do we recognize it imagine 
We've been living in cultures that don't have functional gratitude and don't understand the potential and possibility of grace. And the move to get back to them actually isn't that hard. As a matter of fact, it requires surrendering to what's already happening. Um, I'm thinking of an old poem that says, you can't help but be who you are. No, excuse me. You can't help but be who you are and where. We have to accept ourselves in the state we are. Same thing for that young person that's suicidal. To tell them that it's wrong to feel that way is not to accept them as who they are where, but to know that that's a temporary state and it can be a step in, into a greater knowledge and awareness and a greater acceptance and surrender to one's own way of being. That's helpful. Could you elaborate on finding grace and gratitude through suffering? Um, I don't know how else to find it. I mean, some other people might know how to find it, but I only find those things through suffering. Now, suffering to me is not a, not a negative thing, as people say these days. It, it's a Latin verb, and it means to carry and to bear. And so part of carrying one's own life is to be bearing uh, inner conflicts, trauma, as they call it nowadays. You know, everybody, no one gets through early childhood without traumatic experiences. It's no matter what the parents try or how much they love and care, there's something about the fact that each soul, each child born is unique. That uniqueness cannot be simply seen, acknowledged, blessed, accepted, and nourished by human parents. Um, it has to really begin its own life and have a sense of suffering or carrying conflict in order to become a creative, fully living, self-aware soul. And so I know that people ask that question, why do good people have hard, tragic experiences? The answer is because we are supposed to, that we are here to learn um, it's interesting, I was talking to someone recently who was really interested in creativity, but not interested in chaos. And, you know, to me, I'm going, no, no, wait a minute. Here's how it works. In all stories of creation, chaos comes first. Chaos is from which creation occurs, and then it eventually creation goes back into chaos in order to renew itself. We are living now through one of those chaotic periods. And so chaos has to be experienced. You could call it suffering, confusion. Um, that's part of creation. So when a person becomes an artist, let's say, a creative artist, they suffer in the sense that they have to feel their own conflicts, they feel the fears that are blocking them from being fully creative, like Prajapati was feeling those, um, and, and go through a sense, artists have to separate themselves, it's called creative isolation, and there's a conflict in separating oneself. The problem is we've been told we shouldn't be having those things and we shouldn't be feeling those things, like the young person who is suicidal. Ancient cultures would take the girls and the boys into a rite of passage, and one of the first teachings would be the knowledge of death. And that would be that every, all life comes from death. Look at a forest, watch the animals. They would learn that. And then they would say sometimes, or they would be told about Rumi who says, die before you die, or given an Irish proverb that says, death is the middle of a long life. And all of a sudden their suicidal ideations are not something wrong with them. It's the fact that they have, they have entered an initiatory phase an inner rite of passage, and not only is the death and loss of something part of it, but that, mm, that whatever you call it, the gap that would be created by loss is filled by grace. So, um, I forget the question, but I'll stop there. Um, and again, thank you for a question. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for being interested in gratitude and grace. We have to question everything, and then we have to learn from our own questions because, you know, the answer, the better the question, the closer we are to the 
to the answer. And so again, thanks for that. So I want to keep going with this because the idea is just to open up these territories and then hopefully each person can find something in one of the ideas or one of the images that then they can work with. So uh, I'm going back to Hafez in another poem. Um, so this is, I read poems by Hafez and Rumi and other mystical poets because they describe this very full abundant world but abundant with imagination, abundant with spirit. Um, this is, a, I call it a divine invitation from Hafez and the Graces. You've been invited to meet the friend and no one can resist such a divine invitation. In the end, all choices narrow down to just two. We can come to the divine, dress for dancing and open to experience, or we can be carried on a stretcher to God's emergency ward. To God's emergency ward. So it's like saying, we can get ready for this. We can, the old African proverb, proverb is, anticipate something beautiful so it can happen. It doesn't mean tell yourself it's going to happen. Leave some opening for the divine and something might happen. Um, but if we don't go that way, then we're headed for the other side of it, the chaos side of it, the dark side of it, which Hafez is calling God's emergency ward. So um, I want to go to this old idea of the, uh, the three layers of life. And um, to me, it's just one of those philosophical things, you know, I found once and I like it because it gives us a way to view the world. And mythology is often about threes, um, you know, because you have mythology is about stories and narration. So you have beginning, middle and end. But then when I was a Catholic kid going to church, it was God the Father, God the Son and Virgin Mary Mother. So you get the, the threes are part of things that are mythical often. Third time is a charm, is a, a, a notion that comes out of fairy tales. Um, but also uh, creativity. The third thing comes from the polarization of the first two things. And so it's a rich, rich thing. And you can s often shape something b by giving it three parts. So this is the three uh, layers of life. And um, the first layer is what you would call daily life or common life with its limitations, its rules, its regulations, even with its um, kind of da daily weather. Um, and, and that's the world of common expectations, uh, the wor world of normal so-called behaviors and even common courtesies. and civil courtesies. Um, and that's the first world. Uh, it's the world of fact and the world of measurement. Um, but that world is increasingly cracked now and falling apart. There is no normal weather anymore. Anybody you talk to is telling you about strange weather things happening wherever they happen to live. Um, that syst the normal systems and patterns of weather that people mostly knew are now altered severely by climate crisis. So that's one thing that's happening on the first layer of life. Um, normal behaviors are now disturbed by extreme patterns and extreme beliefs and, and uh, conspiracy theories. So that what was normal is now thrown up in the air and turned upside down, whether it's politics and even economics has extremes now that where things swing in much wider you know, ranges. And so the first level, which would be the normal and the common level, is now cracking and, uh, and being disturbed at the level of nature as well as at the level of culture. And polarization is one of those dynamics where the first layer used to be more common courtesy and now you can be in a very tense, polarized situation just by saying the wrong word. So the first layer is now disrupted and when the first layer is disrupted, what happens is the second layer enters the world more fully. 
And another way to call refer to the second layer is a fall from grace, just playing with the word grace. The second layer is the broken ground of dysfunction, is the territory of uh, anxiety and sadness and fear. It's the place of betrayal, where information is confused by disinformation, where delusions and conspiracies flourish, the place where authorities abuse power and the shadows of life continue to grow, the second layer. Um, I hope you get the sense of that. Um, in many, when, when culture is more stable, um, what happens is things divide and the first layer uh, becomes the people that are doing well and the second layer become the people that are the outcasts or that are the lower caste or something. And what's happened now, I think, all the first layer things have cracked and the second layer things have poured in where the world goes through upheaval, the shadows are more present, the, uh, the otherwise inner hidden conflicts are played out in front of everybody. That's second layer. So we mostly live in the second layer now. And then like the question about um, um, conflict and creation, if we see that second layer as simply a fall from grace with no possible return, then we're starting to get pulled in to the, the heaviness of the anxieties and fears, and we begin to lose our sense that uh, each life has purpose and meaning, and that's happening to a lot of people now. Um, and so it becomes really important to know something about the third layer. First layer, basic life, when things are going well. Second layer, all of the heavy, dark, conflicted, polarized, troubled, anxious parts of life uh, that happen all the time and sometimes become much more pronounced. And then the third level is the realm of uh, what some people call universal love and understanding. It's the ground of interconnectedness and the sense of community with all beings. Um, that's third layer stuff. The third layer is the place of forgiveness, peace, gratitude and grace. The third layer is the still point at the center, but also the center as the place of awakening to awe. So in other words, in the third layer, you can have peace and you can have a beauty and serenity, but also the third layer and the center of life can be peaceful on one side. On another side, it's the source of creation and the place of awakening. It's the residence of the great spirit. Psychologically, they call it the deep self. People called it the soul of the individual connected to the soul of the world, the third layer, the individual soul, essentially connected to the living soul of the world. That's third layer stuff. Um, so um, the third layer is the place of blessings, it's the place of awakenings, it's the place of creativity, but also the place of peace, centeredness, and calm. First layer, basic stuff that either works or doesn't work. Second layer, all the things that are dysfunctional and troublesome in the world. And the third place is the place that we want to be. You know, much of our longing is to be in that third place. And uh, so the good news is there's a third layer and everybody has access to it. The bad news is um, the only way to get to the third layer is by going through the second layer. A lot of people have trouble with this. It's, it's like the idea that all the trouble in the world, why is it there? Why can it not be there? It's like all the meaningful stories are stories where the, the, the char main characters in the story struggle with things, face the struggles that they have, and that's what changes things. And so the, uh, the good news is the third layer is always nearby the second the bad news is that we have to go through that second layer, whatever that means to us, in order to get there. On the individual level, right now on the collective level, the third level, which would be the visions and awakening of a sense of a new world, uh, another world, a world more inclusive, a world more imaginative, a world more caring, that's possible, but we have to go through the second layer sense of the world now to get there. So this third layer is our soul inheritance, 
Um, and we tend to seek it in art and in music, in love, in sensuality, in sexuality, in religion and spirituality, in meditation, in healing, in laughter, on vacations, on pilgrimages. All of those things in their own way are doorways into the third layer. I'm just trying to say that it's nearby, it's a natural inheritance of the human soul, and it's something that is calling to us all the time. Um, I will mention another problem with the third layer, which is that, well, the second layer, we can find our way there in a certain way on a given occasion, and we may not be able to go back through it that way again. The, the doorway to the third layer is a moving thing. So a person has a practice and the practice opens up this third layer and they get realization, they get some kind of uh, wonder, they get inspiration, they get peace, they get whatever they get. And then the next time they go, it doesn't work that way. Something else has to happen because it's a living process and we change and just as we change, the doorway moves. I hope that makes sense. Because some people will say, well, you know, I, I had a good experience and then it was gone and I couldn't get it back again. Well, it's nearby. We just have to find a doorway by changing ourselves. Um, I'm going to restate, you can't go directly from first layer to the third layer. The second layer is the place of awakening. It's the middle ground of rite of passage. It's the dramatic territory of initiation. Um, so... Let's see. I'm going to make a few more statements, then um, I think it looks like there are more questions. Um, so, gratitude was called the parent of all virtues, and it was connected to natural nobility of the soul. And this third layer, which is so important um, in order to un understand the realm that we actually live in, um, our connection to it comes from a natural nobility in the soul. Everyone born has natural nobility. The difficulties of life and the, you know, the injustices of life can cause a person to lose or not connect to their own nobility, but it's there. The human soul and the human heart are noble by their own nature. Um, Occasions of grace can bring that sense of nobility back. Um, so I'm just stating that because it's just important to know that it's possible. That's why you don't give up on people. Something can happen, not just that they will to change, but they try and then something not of them, of grace, comes and a change occurs. That can happen to a culture too if the struggle is undertaken. Um, so, well, maybe I'll stop there because I see questions. Can you speak of the capacity that grace and or gratitude have in healing or helping to move beyond divisiveness? Yes. I'm going to go back. I've said it kind of, I'm going to say it again. Um, divisiveness means when things are divided, there is no gratitude. So here in the United States, you have this intense political uh, divide, and, and increasingly you'll, you have people acting out of resentment, grievances, um, you know, and, and willing to destroy social fabric because of the intensity of the grievance they feel. If you ask those people, do they feel grateful, you're going to hear, no, they do not. They feel anything but grateful. So the problem is you can't make them grateful Somehow people have to begin to find gratitude inside themselves. Gratitude only exists when those conflicts stop being something that tears them apart. Gratitude is a state of wholeness, a temporary state of wholeness. So my sense of it is we can't have a, a peace fire or a solution of the divisions by making political agreements, it actually has to come from people finding it in themselves. And so that's a problematic thing. In other words, you can't argue someone that you disagree with into gratitude. But if we have our own gratitude, that starts to affect the psychic field, I guess you would say. So that's, that's the first idea there. If people are 
fiercely committed to their grievances and their angers and their resentments, they are very far from gratitude and they are very far from grace and they're much closer to burning things down. And you can't simply get that out of that easily. Um, there was something else there, though. Um, okay. <clears throat> oh, yeah. It was, it was a question about how do you get to healing. The word healing means make whole. It really means make whole again. So, again, the problem is healing means facing up to entering into that which is torn and broken and, and, and divided in order to find the healing. And part of the healing comes from the individual, and part of it comes from the archetype of healing, which draws on energies that are like grace coming from outside the human, in a sense. Um, and so that's the rough world we're in. And the first thing, it's like that old the story they tell on an airplane. When you find that the airplane's going down, you've got to get your uh, face mask and your oxygen mask on before you take care of, even if it's your child next to you, because you, you'll both go if, if you're not able to function. So the first thing is we get our own oxygen of um, nurturance and, and self-awareness and self-care, and, and we have to do that. And then opportunities arise where you can reach across. And I don't know if it works out politically. I don't know how that goes. The old idea is what changes the individual soul eventually changes the world. Um, it's a collective rite of passage, but we're each going through it individually. And the only part we can really change is ourselves. So the more we can find unity in ourselves, strangely enough, the less we will be totally disturbed by the conflict in the world. And then moments occur when our sense of unity can have an effect on other people and that's how I think it goes. Um, okay. Is that how do you have gratitude and appreciate the graces you see when those around you do not uh, or cannot see it, or or I cannot see how they see it? Namely, family, especially at a time of discord in greater collective. So this time of year, at least in this hemisphere, we're in going into the dark time, and then here comes. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, for instance, which is built around gratitude, giving thanks. Uh, and then what happens is all the suffering, all the unfinished initiations, all the unspoken, unresolved conflicts inside people and between people come up. And it seems like it ruins the whole thing. But that's because the idea of the Thanksgiving has become so materialistic, so cooked down, so disconnected from what a real ritual would be, that it backfires, you know? I mean, it's great that there's a Thanksgiving, but if you take the process of creation, transformation, and change to be essentially involved with conflict and facing up to troublesome things, then all the stuff should get talked out, and then you have the, the grateful dinner. You know, back to the person at the beginning, say, should I pretend that I'm grateful when I'm not? You can't just say we're going to cook the turkey, sit down and all be together when there are other things and there are always other things. You know, you think of a sweat lodge. You go into a sweat lodge, everybody has to strip down, you have to sit on the earth, you have to get a little bit dirty, you have to be in the heat of things, um, like an alchemical process, and often in the sweat lodge, the first thing is everybody puts out what is tearing them apart. And doing it collectively like that begins to change the energy. Yeah, the heat and the rocks, all that helps. But opening the heart and soul moves the process at a alchemical level. And then the prayers come out. And then when the people come out of the ritual experience, they embrace each other, even if they don't know each other, they hurt each other's pain. Now we can be grateful together. Am I making sense? We've lost that. And we have these uh, like uh, remnants of ritual and we expect them to give things, us the things and, they, and it doesn't work. The dark of the year is the ritual time. Many of the leftover rituals, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, New Year's, those are all the rituals of the darkness, finding the light, 
finding the hidden gratitude, opening the darkness to the uh, um, possibilities of grace. But it's done by facing up to things and having genuine ritual practices. Um, what are simple daily gratitude practices we can work with and are there ones we can do together? I just mentioned some we can do together. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, there's so many ways you can do it. Um, all right. So I love myths and deities and I don't believe in the deities. You're not supposed to. They're manifestations of imagination that have uh, archetypal elements that makes them endurable and valuable as like a doorway that opens to something. And so I have lots of those. I have, you know, my Kuan Yin's and Hanuman and, 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 and different from different cultures and stuff. And, and I each day, strange, and my mother who has passed on, I could hear her on the other side going, I told you, I told you you would pray again. Because <laughs> I start each day by, by bowing um, and, and, and really acknowledging whatever pain is going on, and then asking for um, uh, forgiveness, actually, and asking for um, support. And, and, it, and so rather than use the same prayer over and over again, it comes out differently each day. I, I allow, allow the prayer to be the thing I'm saying, and sometimes I'm surprised at what comes out. So there's that. Uh, similar to that is you create a shrine and every time you're feeling overwhelmed or, or overburdened or you're really worried about someone, you light a candle, put it on the shrine, and you make a prayer. Um, the oldest definition of prayer is uh, any time you're thinking of something beyond yourself, you pray. So it's a really low bar. You can really get in there and, 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 and the idea is to be creative with it. Uh, and let the, let the heart begin to speak in its own language. Be surprised at what can come out. Um, so that's a couple of things I think of. Um, and a lot of people do the thing where you think, well, what am I grateful for? Can I find one thing to be grateful for? I mean, for instance, all the attention that people are properly bringing to breathing now. Breathing is the basic you know, activity of life. You can go for days without food. You can go for more than a day without water. You can't go more than a few minutes without breath. So you go right back to that basic thing. And in that breath, there can be a very simple gratitude for the breath of life, gratitude for the gift of life. The, the world in mythological terms is recreating itself every day. And it doesn't seem like that. We each actually have the possibility of recreating parts of ourselves each day. So once you get into this stuff, it opens up and beca can become many different things. At least those are the suggestions I have in the moment. Can you speak to narcissism, uh, which points to an insecure ego and its connections to gratitude? Thank you. If one has an insecure ego, how can they experience gratitude right on? I mean, think of the major figures that represent the conflicts and the narcissism and the egomania in the world today. Here in the United States, we have Donald, Donald Trump. Russia has Putin. Uh, we have Elon Musk also. They tend to be masculine figures, not only, but they tend to be kind of bigger than life and not human. They tend, tend to not have empathy or, or sympathy. Um, they tend to be unendingly needy. So narcissism is this exaggerated state um, where no matter how much you give to that person, they are never full. And because they are never full and because they are not only insecure, but they are so deeply wounded that they can't be grateful, no matter how much wealth they have, no matter how much power they have, no matter how much adoration they have. You know, just watch, you know, very famous, powerful figures. They need attention all the time. Why? The energy of attention is a real thing. It goes into them, but there's big, there's not just insecurity, there's huge cracks and crevices, and all the energy going in is gone within a minute or two. I mean, I've known, been on stage with people that have narcissistic, narcissistic issues 
that at least I thought were bigger than mine. Um, so I observed theirs. I don't know how to observe mine. But anyway, I observed theirs. And you're on stage and you do something halfway creative and people clap, you know, because everybody is really hoping this could happen more. And, uh, and you go off stage and, and I've had someone turn to me and say, that wasn't enough pl- applause. I'm, I'm still vibrating from it. And there's, it's already gone. It's already gone. So, um, so narcissism is not just the big ego. It's also the deep, deep, deep insecurity and cracks that cause what could be satisfying to other people to leak right out immediately and they need adoration right away. Everybody's narcissistic to some degree. I think these big figures are there now for us to learn from. You watch and you can see, you don't have to have a psychology book in a way, you can see narcissism being played out on global uh, scale. Um, The one, one of the best psychological ideas I've ever encountered is the bigger the front, the bigger the back. Everybody has a shadow. You can't outrun your shadow. You can cover it up, but it's still there. And so when you see a big front, you can intuit a big shadow. And people are supposed to consider that before they vote. How can we make amends and make peace with those we love who hold heavy trauma and have pushed us away? Do we just hold space through prayer? sending light to help restore wholeness, or do we also try to make amends through actions in the physical world? I mean, it's a really good question, and it's a really important thing, and it's a really difficult thing. Um, And I would just add the idea, all the disturbances, disturbances in the world are stirring up all the troubles inside people. So these things that might have been kept quieter for longer are actually up and more active. And that does create the possibility of seeking healing and dealing with them and facing them more. But those things are difficult and you can't make another person do what you want them to do. And so it comes back to ourselves. Uh, Sometimes if we can forgive ourselves and honestly engage ourselves for what we contributed to the pain or the, the, the problem or the issues. That actually secretly has an effect on the other person. You can't count on it, but it can happen. But again, I think that do we just hold space through prayer? I mean, you know, you, you, you have to try things, you know. For instance, most young, young people eventually have to go back to the parent and say, hey, some things went wrong, I really got hurt. You know, and that's an important thing. And the job of the parent is to accept it or in a sense to die because the experience of the child doesn't match the experience of the parent, right? So one of the ways we can learn how to get through things like that if we are a parent is when someone comes and says, you really messed up and I got really hurt, whatever it is, uh, you don't contradict it and you don't say, you got to hear my version of it. You, You accept that so that they can have a chance to feel what it's like to move that burden inside themselves, you know, and then we have to go do our thing. Uh, it made me think of in parts of West Africa when they want someone to become an elder, people, you can't run for the office of elder, you can't campaign, campaign. you can't use super PACs and get a bunch of dark money and, and become an elder. You're invited to do it because you've so, shown some growth in your own psyche. But what they do is interesting, Um, the tradition in West Africa. uh, The person who's going to be the elder uh, has to be stripped down and covered with ashes as if they have to begin to imagine themselves inside the ashes that they've made of their own life opportunities. And then they sit inside a hut and then people come in and anyone who knows them can come in and say to them all of the harm that they cause and and so I know some people who have gone through it and they say, someone comes in that I knew, you know, when I was seven years old and tells me all these things and I didn't do them. And the rule is you can't say anything. And so I'm not saying it's the best practice, but it's amazing because the person who's going to be an elder, the person who's going to be wiser, the person who's going to have understanding sits in their own ashes and just goes, you know, thank you for accusing me of things I didn't do. Uh, why? Not to be, you know, self-harming or something, but it's back to the ego and the narcissism to realize 
that if we're going to be helpful, we might have to have not such a thin skin and we might have to have done enough of our crusades to prove ourselves and justify ourselves that now we can act some other way. I'm just reacting to the idea of how do we get through these things. Can you speak to the epidemic of estrangement in families and how one could both protect oneself and yet be open to grace and gratitude and the possibility of reconnection? Really beautifully put, yes. I mean, we have to take care of ourselves. And if something is so bad that, you know, you can't simply pretend it's not there, I mean, then it has to be left alone until something can be figured out, but always with the idea that something could change because anyone could change and grace could enter somewhere. I mean, just the way that was described is, you know, families are really uh, tough places in which to grow and they're only the places in which to grow. And no family can ever satisfy the needs or the longings of its own children. In ancient Ireland, they, ha they have the idea that the, the family and the parents are on, have only contributed one third of the life energy of the child. It's a really great idea because we think of it as our children and we think of them as our parents, but this ancient idea says the parents only contribute one third. There's another third that is an ancestral energy trying to come back into the world. And then the final third is a creative energy that's never been in the world. And so when we have nuclear families, no extended family to break down all the pain and confusion and spread it out a bit. No um, aunts and uncles that can play the role that mom and dad are not able to do with that child. We're in this nuclear thing. It gets very explosive and very damaging. And, and then people don't even know that the parents are not completely responsible for that child, nor do they know what the future of that child should be or could be. Um, and then we don't have the second thing. So rite of passage I mentioned earlier, initiation practice, call it what you will, um, it had two major things. One was to take, the, to take the person out of childhood and set them up for the rest of their life. Um, but that required two other things, one of which was to reveal their natural gifts and the purpose of their life that would be part of the process. And then the, the deeper sense of that would be to reveal the wounds they already have and begin to heal them. So we're missing essential things that would give everybody a much better chance. Imagine being in a community that was connected to the earth where it was living and the process of nature and had its own rituals so, so that at least once a year everybody would come together and everybody would try to relieve all the, all the burdens and, and wounds that they're all carrying. And I'm thinking of New Year's rituals, you know, um, where some tribes that live like along the Amazon River on the New Year, which usually takes more than one night, it takes seven days often. But anyway, part of it is everybody goes down to the river, right? The water is the source of life, it's the origin of life, the womb of life, the oceans and the rivers and the lakes, that kind of thing. And they go down and they all get hands full of mud. It's, it's a tribe, it's a village, there's not that many of them, they all know each other, they interact all the time. And so they then throw mud at anybody who has offended them. And pretty soon everybody's thrown mud at everybody and everybody's covered with mud. They've kind of gotten all that inner wounding, all that inner confusion and conflict out, and they've stuck it on each other as earth, and then they all go in the water and wash it off, and then they have their New Year celebration. So, I mean, going back to the question about are there rituals, what things can we do, some of the things that are missing are really big things. You know, imagine the family, each of us thinks of our family, had we been living in an awakened enough uh, community to be connected to the uh, rhythms of nature, where you would see death and life and death and all kinds of things, you learn to accept and understand the mystery of it all. And then you go through rituals where you see these members of your family in a different light. And the family is opened up to the community and everybody's covered with mud because we all made mistakes and then we all forgive each other and then we all go mess it up again. And all of a sudden it start, starts to get humorous also. 
We're missing all that. And we're caught in this subject-object division that is a real core polarization that is unpsychological. It's not intelligent. It's not creative. It's just polarization. It makes it hard for everybody. There's a lot that has to be redeemed, reimagination, reimagined and reinvented. And in the process of doing that, we find some gratitude and grace becomes more available. Can you speak to grace and gratitude in intimate partnership? My relationship has entered the second level (laughs) and I want to have faith that it can make it to the third, but I'm afraid my partner is wanting to give up as we face the chaos and suffering of the second layer. Thank you for the honesty and thank you for using the images so well Um, because everybody can follow you right away. Every relationship has a second layer or a second level. It's there. It's there as soon as the people come together. You know, as soon as two people come together, a shadow forms also. Um, and strangely, this is the weird, another weird thing. The, 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 the func- part of the function of intimate relationships is to bring up everybody's issue, right? If you don't have any relationship, the issues don't get activated so often. But as soon as people agree to be intimate, try to love each other, what's going to happen is the obstacles to loving each other oneself are going to come up, you know, and that affects how you love each other. And it's, again, it's a really hard thing because it's done in, as a nuclear pair in a, in a community, in a culture that doesn't solve uh, conflicts and divisions. And so to be creative in that, to be uh, intimate in the midst of those, that takes courage. So I want to just say, first of all, it takes courage to acknowledge it and try to work on it. And I don't know good ways. I've never, you know, I have ex-intimate partners who will, you know, validate that I'm not very good at it. Um, It's always worth the try. Uh, Again, I'm thinking of uh, African, West African. They have lots of uh, traditions in West Africa. And one of them is that when the two people come together, you know, they don't spend as much time together as we do. So when they come together together, things can be interesting. But when there's an argument and something has to be dealt with, they come together and each has a bowl of water. And each time you say to the other person, you know, what bothered you, you splash them with water. And eventually they're both covered with water. It's like the mud ritual. And and, in other words, so, so it's made not simply personal. And those, you know, watering down things, it gets pretty humorous. And then pretty soon, you know, the word Yuma comes from humus, which means earth. And as soon as it gets earthy, sometimes that lights the fire again. And the next thing, intimacy can happen on many levels. I know that's not very helpful in the given uh, circumstance. I'm just saying it takes courage and it takes creativity. Um, it, a lot of relationships can be learning how to fight. You know, learn, learning how to be at odds with each other. Um, and I'll say one more thing about that. If people are going to enter it, there has to be a couple of agreements. One is no physical violence, obviously. That's that's a trauma from a different time that may have to be healed somewhere else. And then no abusive uh, emotional violence, if it can be avoided. And then a third thing for me would be not leaving. To agree, we're going to stay in this. We're not going to hurt each other. We're going to be honest, and we're going to stay in this. Because as soon as someone leaves, then both people are thrown into abandonment issues, let's say. And then it's really hard to get anything out of it. And I'm not saying those things are easy, but uh, sometimes lighting some candles, creating a space and say, we know we have these hard things, but we're going to do it, attempt to do it in this way. I mean, I just had the thought of doing it near water and then jumping in the water to wash it all off. Somehow it has to be experienced and released in order to come back together again. And then the shadow stuff comes up and it has to happen again. Uh, Good luck on on that and thank you for the courage of it. All right. Um, Can you speak to the relationship between forgiveness and grace? Thank you. I don't think I can speak to it very well, Um, but it's really, you know, just to hear it is important. So um, one of the hardest things, I think, is to forgive 
oneself, to forgive myself. Um, it's, it's a really important thing. Um, I'll have a poem, a poem coming up uh, about forgiveness um, because it's really important. Um, if I can't forgive myself for mistakes that I've made, harms that I've caused, I really can't move on very far. And it's very hard uh, to open the heart and soul if there's no forgiveness. And so for me, the relationship would be the more I can forgive myself, the more I am surrendering. And the more I surrender, the more possible it is for grace to enter and change things. Um, I really think forgiveness is a, is a beautiful and powerful transformative thing, but it has to begin with self-forgiveness. And, and then, yeah, I guess it would then open the door of possibilities for grace to enter. And so maybe that's an important connection that you're suggesting there. Um, I'll go back to Kuan Yin and many of the, the goddesses and the female deities who are figures of mercy and forgiveness. And uh, to imagine that that's part of the world. Um, and, and maybe I'll do this Hafez poem and then we're moving towards the end anyway. So this is the poem I was thinking of. It's interesting because I was going to do it when I finished the questions. It's called The Great Secrets, Hafez. God, so Hafez, Rumi, mystical poets, they talk about God. It's not about a belief system. To me, God is the smallest, the fewest number of letters you can use to represent the divine. Let's do it that way. God, goddess. God was so full of wine last night, so full of wine, that he let a great secret slip. He said, there is no one on this earth who needs pardon and forgiveness from, from me, for there is really no such thing, no such thing as a sin. As a recovering Catholic, you know, when I found that poem, I just put it up on the wall, you know. Uh, so, so that's an interesting thing. So forgiveness had the divine in it. And that's an interesting thing. And imagine, you know, it's very different from the, I was raised to believe in the original sin and all that kind of stuff. But if you imagine that there are deities and aspects of the world that want to forgive us, it helps. Um, and so, um, yeah, forgiveness probably is a path to grace. Um, all right, so, all right. This is um, going to the graces, but particularly the, the grace having to do with joy. This is Hafez again. Hafez is a great poet for the mystical realm of joy and openness, vulnerability, and, and beauty. What can I tell you? but the good news from the invisible world that I heard last night as I sat drunk and ruined in the tavern. Hoard each joyous moment and every loving touch that comes to you, for no one knows how this dance will end. I'm gonna read it again. Um, the world is really hard, it's not gonna get easy soon. So, joyous moments, Hafez is saying hoard them, and any loving touch, hoard that too. What can I tell you but the good news from the invisible world that I heard last night as I sat drunk and ruined in the tavern? Hoard each joyous moment and every loving touch that comes to you, for no one knows how this dance will end. Just kind of in the realm of grace. Okay, this is more Hafez. Why you came here. You that came to birth in order to bring the mysteries back to life. All of you who came to life to bring the wonder back. Your voice and song makes all the creatures in the world very happy. So please sing from the depth of your soul and tear the veil off this moment of becoming. Wow, you know. I mean, that's, parts of us are supposed to live that way. There's joy there, there's, you know, wonder there, 
um, there's grace there. And it goes without saying there's a gratitude for life in that. That's third layer. We have to get the taste of the third layer in some fashion. Or we're in a desert. We're in an emotional desert. And we become susceptible to very heavy and untractable things. So, um, all right, I'm going to do one more poem. And there's a couple here I'm looking at. Uh, I guess now is the time I'll do this poem. This is uh, Rumi, called Now is the Time. So I'm going back to the idea that in the midst of the second layer is when the third layer becomes possible. In the midst of the dark world is when the return of the light becomes possible. That's what the ritual of solstice is. Corin was saying this, the next series that we're doing is called The Light Inside Dark Times. It's in the dark times that we find the hidden light. And so Rumi has, now is the time. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. Now, why not consider a lasting truce between you and the divine? Now is the time to understand that all your ideas of right and wrong were just a child's training wheels to be laid aside when you can finally live with veracity and love. Now is the time for the world to know that every thought and every action is sacred. This is the time for you to deeply compute the impossibility that there is anything but grace in this world. Now is the time to know that everything you do is sacred. That's a poem completely in the third layer, how the world looks from the third layer. From there, looking back at the agonies and the confusions of the second layer, it all looks different. And the first layer, Who even cared about that? Who wanted to be normal? I'll do it one more time and then a song. Now is the time to know that all you do is sacred. That means the struggles and the mistakes. Now, why not consider a lasting truce with the divine? Now is the time to understand that all your ideas of right and wrong were just a child's training wheels to be laid aside when you can finally live in the veracity and love. Now is the time for the world to know that every thought and action is sacred. This is the time for all of us to deeply compute the impossibility that there is anything but grace in this world. Now is the time to know that everything you do is sacred. So there's a grace poem. All right. Gratitude from me, from Corin, from Mosaic to you for coming and being bearing with this event for caring about these things and uh, blessings on the way because this world is hard. So back to the song, Mother Earth hold us for this world is hard. Aye yo, aye ele, aye yo, aye shuru ne ne e yu ya ne ne. Ah, 
ye shuru thank you